So welcome, Dr. Freiberg. It's good to have you uh, doing this interview with us today. I'm excited about what you've been doing and very much looking forward to sharing with our viewers a little bit more about what I see as making a really positive difference in the world. So why don't you just start out with introducing yourself to us? You know, who are you as a doctor and then as a person? Sure. Well, first, thanks so much for having me. It's a privilege uh, to have this conversation with you to share with a wider public. So my name is David Freiberg. I am an internist endocrinologist and always thought I'd grow old and die the professor. I loved academic medicine. I loved the teaching, the research, the seeing patients. All of it was just fantastic. Um, but as I was looking at things, I had decided that I wanted to be able to do more than I could for patients um, and society than I could in my lab. So I bit the, the bullet, if you will, and um, took a, a, a jump to the pharmaceutical industry. And there I did something called translational medicine for, oh, about 13 years. Um, and that was a great experience where I not only uh, got to interact with a lot of very smart and talented people working on projects, in other words, that would affect patients at large. They were uh, higher risk projects, but they were um, great because they were new therapeutics and applying science and taking care of patients. It had a lot of appeal. Eventually though, I left the pharmaceutical industry um, and because I'd gotten a, a nice offer to consult and leading teams of scientists from around the world working for what's called a public-private consortium for the foundation for the NIH. And that was fantastic because all of our work, they were, there were scientists from academia, scientists from industry, scientists from the government, from FDA and NIH. And we all tried to work together because measures that we commonly use, like even you know, things that are readily accepted, blood pressure or hemoglobin A1C, there are other measures that go into um, drug discovery and development. And those uh, are, are recurrently questioned as to what do they really mean? So how much insulin, for example, is secreted at a certain amount of time? Um, that was a fantastic experience. And it was during that time when I wasn't sitting in meetings all day that I started reading the news more. Now this is back in 2011. So um, I think a, a different time in terms of news cycles. A little calmer period of our society. Relatively, but even so, I found that I was getting sad and you know melancholy, not frankly depressed, but very sad in a dose dependent way to how I was reading or taking in the news. So when you say dose dependent, what do you mean? The more I read, the sadder I got. Gotcha. Um, and if I read at the beginning of the day, it could affect the entire day, et cetera. So the nerd in me said, huh, when I realized this, let me go look at the literature and see what it says about this. And lo and behold, there were papers that said, when people would watch, you know, at that time, television news. Um, uh, it was really pre-active internet days that uh, within minutes, they could become depressed, not only about the things that like, for example, the war in Syria, but they could be depressed about or worried as regards their own lives, some aspect of their lives, like will their mother be okay? Will their job be okay? Are their children gonna do well? So it not only affected distal events, but it affected proximal events. I leaned back and I, when I, after reading this, and I thought, well, that's not fair because people are generally good. People are generally kind. They're really struggling, like everyone is searching for meaning. What is purpose? What is meaning? Why am I here? How do I find happiness and security and get on with their lives? And could that affect their quality of life? So that's what began this, this journey. 
So you had these questions for the bigger picture, but it sounds like you were also dealing with those questions for yourself. Would that be correct? Um, I, I always was struggling with that. I mean, the, the reasons why I left academia and then went to industry, and then when I left industry to, to do other work was to be able to help people in a more broad way. And helping people was certainly a major source of meaning for me. So perhaps you saw this as a way to help people more than what you had been doing? Yes, and more effectively. Science, for example, I could publish some excellent papers and they got into you know very respectable journals, but I'd also look at them and say, okay, how does this help somebody? And that wasn't as satisfying for me. It's wonderful work and it's not a criticism of anything else. It was just for me, it was important to expand that and see how I was giving back, how I was contributing. And so this was a progressive process. So you were seeking to make a bigger difference, help more people be more effective. What, what was that transition like for you where you went from this consulting academic sort of process to doing something really new and different? It, it sort of just snuck up on me to frankly, the, um, I was still working as a consultant. And when I experienced this with the news, I thought, well, I can either complain about this till the day that I die, or I can go and try to do something about it. And if I was going to try to do something about it, what would that look like? Um, and that's how this started. And this, the, this is this kindness organization that you know, we're going to talk about today. Excellent. Then um, I leaned back and said, wouldn't it be nice if people were just kinder to each other? And there are some wonderful, I did my market research, if you will. I looked at what was out there. There are some wonderful kindness organizations. Most of them um, were focused on curricula, teaching children um, in particular. Um, and imbuing them with principles of kindness at an early age. Really some wonderful organizations that do great work. So was this just one day you're sitting in your office or something and you lean back and say, why not have more kindness? Well, it, it was sort of a progressive outgrowth of all of these thoughts bubbling up. I've led a bunch of different initiatives and I, I know what it takes to get a complex initiative, you know, uh, started and completed, but um, this was beyond what I th ended up thinking it would be. So it was more of a progressive process for you. Yes. Very good. So in this journey of focusing on kindness, going from more of a typical career to a kindness career, what, what are the takeaways? What are the key concepts that you found and or have been working with? There, this has actually been sort of and frankly stumbling into things. So the way that this started was that I just really wanted to rebalance what people saw. So as an endocrinologist, I used to see many patients with diabetes and had many discussions on diet. So just for our viewers, an endocrinologist does what? What kind of specialty is that? Uh, uh, hormones with, uh, and because diabetes, particularly type two is the most common endocrine disorder that would make up a large amount of my clinical practice, those gotcha. kinds of patients. And, ob and all, most patients with type two diabetes are obese. And uh, since it's very diet susceptible or controllable, that would be a, a major a part of conversations with patients. So I analogizing from it, I ended up calling this the visual diet. So it wasn't food in this case, but it was the imagery that people took in. And I, call, I, I turned the phrase, just as you are what you eat, to you are what you see. And that people's emotions and behaviors are uh, affected uh, consciously, but also really subconsciously without their realizing it by the imagery that they see and experience. 
As an aside, I also came to learn, and I didn't know it then, that diet, the root in Greek, uh, comes from a way of life. It had nothing to do with food was just one aspect of that. But diet embraced a lot of behaviors, if you will. So you were getting back actually to the more accurate or original definition of diet, whole person diet. Absolutely. Um, and so it, to go back to your original question, it started as this idea of just rebalancing what people saw. And it was very simple, is that if we could share imagery of kindness and compassion, diverse imagery with people, and then do it quickly because people are busy, they're in a hurry, everyone's overloaded with information that they're taking in, um, and let them go on their way. That's how it started. It turned into something that was much broader than that. So you, I love this concept of a whole person diet and that we are what we see, basically. And so your intention was to just take that concept and apply it into people's busy modern life. Absolutely. The intent was to help people connect better with each other, to reduce stress, connect better with each other, and from that, raise their quality of life. So I'm hearing in this, in this uh, definition, if you will, of kindness, this space, we're talking specifically about connection and stress reduction, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. And this obviously fits very well with lifestyle medicine, lifestyle as medicine, and the concept of diet, diet being the whole person diet, what has this led you to be working on at this point in time? Well, um, so this uh, progressed because uh, my son's urging, my son, my eldest son was um, instrumental in helping get this the nonprofit called Envision Kindness started. And uh, with his urging and that of uh, some other folks we were interacting with, they said, look, you're a scientist. Why don't you prove this point? So we, we did a study, our first, in which there were 400 people. They were assigned to four different groups, three of which had um, image types uh, or images that psychologists from, from a standard set psychologists have used for years. So we could benchmark the impact of these images. And then we added a fourth group of kindness images. So there were negative, neutral, positive, and then there were um, uh, kindness images. The negatives and neutrals, negatives were violent, um, disgusting things. Neutral, hammers, doorknobs, light switches. Positive images were typical go-tos for people. Puppies in a basket, flowers, bunnies, some I'd consider kindness images, a mother and child, a father and son um, types of images. The kindness images in this study were less pretty. A uh, woman in distress on a dark stairwell being comforted by a police officer. A sea of shaven heads with one face looking up and it's a young man going for chemotherapy and he shaved, his friends shaved their heads in support. And these people, the participants in the study, completed uh, surveys before and after. They were all standard published psychology surveys. And we, we got help from people who really knew what they were doing. Psych uh, though I've done a lot of human-based research, I had never done a psychology study. So we wanted people to, you know, to really help here. What happened blew my mind was that the, the positive groups will leave out the negative and neutrals. Um, they did, all of them did what they were expected to do and had been published on. The positives, people who were already pretty happy at baseline were a bit happier, were more positive, were more optimistic, a little bit more loving and trusting. The kindness images, despite the difficulty that I described for some of them, had doubled the effect of the positive images in inducing happiness and love and optimism and trust. Um, it had a soaring increase in reported self-compassion, 
or compassion, self-reported compassion, excuse me. And uh, this, a friend of mine who's a statistician who worked on, volunteered to process and analyze the data said that he had never seen a data set segregate like this. Wow. And neither had I. And while we had a substantial number, there were a hundred in each group, the fact that this happened with a, my pretest hypothesis is if we did as well as the positive images, that would be great. But that we were doing twice as well said that there was something very important going on here. This wasn't an accident. And so it took me now from this initial journey that I started on where we're rebalancing and helping people see this to what is the psychology and biology of altruism, of kindness. And that was a huge discovery that it took a few months of study for me, reading papers and going back to Darwin and learning that, for example, Darwin was misquoted um, and, and misunderstood. Darwin, in fact, wrote in his second book, The Descent of Man, that um, species in which sac members sacrifice for one another have the greatest chance or greater chance of survival than those who don't. And that, in fact, um, the evolutionary biologists had concluded that this was important for survival because if members were not going to cooperate, that they would end up being uh, likely not surviving. And survival here, of course, is odds of reproduction. Everything, a lot of it for evolutionary biology comes back to the ability to reproduce and continue the species. It also turned out that people who were kind is measured by volunteerism had mortality rates that were 20 to 40% less than those uh, who didn't. Now, for your viewers, if you're not familiar with the medicine and maybe these numbers don't mean very much, if you go from contaminated water to clean water, or you go from uh, vaccination against major disease like measles, a drop of in mortality of 20% is huge. That's what you'd expect. So now we're looking at, you know, and volunteerism is obviously complicated. And these are epidemiologic studies, meaning for uh, to help people understand they're surveying or following people over time and just asking them questions and then seeing what happens. So they're complicated because there's a lot of stuff that's going on at the same time. But study after study is showing very similar results different populations. So you got into this kindness space thinking, let's have some more kindness in the world, but you were blown away by the results you were getting in your own research and what you ended up finding in the other research. Would that be correct? Yeah. So what is that leading you to do at this point in time? What are you, how are you making this tangible and what are you taking into the future, if you will? So the, the tangible part, it's after learning this and much more. And there's a paper coming out in American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, which details much more about integrates this biology and how it relates to the biology of stress and disease. Is to make it accessible, we've created a program that's called Inspire that takes these images, combines them with other content, uh, kindness related content, and that we have created and streams them into higher stress settings. The first higher stress setting we're starting with is healthcare. So that the tangible part is it's passive. We're built to respond to it. Nature uh, made us this way. And there's a very, there are very deliberate reasons why. Um, and it also has relationship to add to loneliness, ostracism, bullying, a variety of related uh, phenomena. So healthcare is definitely a very stressful environment, but what does this look like? What, what would a healthcare provider or someone working in healthcare experience with your Inspire work? 
the first level is they feel uplifted. So, so let me back up a little bit. So if I'm walking down the hallway or I'm in a doctor's office, how is, how is this coming to me? Okay, so it, it, it's coming through streamed into the waiting room and can be streamed into work rooms. It's really just limited by the numbers of places that people want to integrate it into the content that they have. So you're talking about a monitor, it's on a TV, right? So in a break room, in a doctor's office, there's a TV on the wall and it's playing on that TV on the wall. Is there sound or is it just the pictures? It's mostly images. There's music, it's a supportive music track. Um, but because these areas are so busy, we did not do voiceover to, uh, so that it, uh, our, all of our messages are relayed visually, not um, from audio. So not dependent on the audio portion. Exactly. Okay. So you're doing healthcare environment first, and then the plan is to take this to other environments, I assume? Yes. People who have seen it have uh, said, oh, this would be good in schools. And this would be good in the, you know, at the time the, when the New York City subway was so busy. And this would be good in someone even suggested prisons. Can, can we put it in the capital? What's wonderful about this is that because we're wired to respond, because this is a, what's, uh, there are two, there's, you know, the subconscious processing or what psychologists would call automatic or Kahneman called the psychologist from Princeton, the Nobel laureate, system one, is that it doesn't require conscious uh, or cognitive engagement. It also makes no moral judgment. It just shows. It's not to say people aren't kind. And people have asked me that before, you know, it, of feeling a little bit affronted and saying, well, I'm a kind person. I said, absolutely. I have no doubt you are a very kind person. The only question I'd ask is, could you be kinder? I know I could be. Um, and so it's an attempt to raise this up. So what you're describing is basically that these visual images tap into our fundamental, very deep wiring, deeper than the level of us having to even consciously process and think about it. And that that inherently impacts our nervous system and changes our physiology. Absolutely. You, you en encapsulated it well. It activates internal reward systems. Okay. So I'm, I can't wait till we get into the, the second session where we dive into some of the details of how this works, some of the physiology and the science. But for this interview section, give us a glimpse of what the future looks like with your Envision Kindness organization and its implementation. So we've got healthcare. Um, my goal is to disseminate this as far as as widely as possible. My goal, it's, you know, it goes back and maybe it, it's a little corny, if you will, but um, like I think for yourself, as I uh, have we as we've talked and I've watched your uh, some of your videos is to help people live a higher quality of life. And so this is the game. Um, if you will, it's this is the end goal. There's really nothing much else to it because that would be incredibly satisfying um, to see people flourish and allow them to then in turn share that with others. And then those people share that with others. And I can see that as a way to evolve without you know, having to chastise people to correct behavior. It's just so much more positive and pleasant. So this organization going forward, is it for-profit, non-profit? And number two, is there a way that people can be involved in helping spread kindness with you? Um, so it is a non, not for-profit, a 501c3 by IRS uh, designation. 
um, and deliberately done that way because I wanted to make it as transparent for people as possible. So, and for people who don't understand not-for-profits, that means there's no ownership. I do not own it. Um, it is a, for public good. That's how the IRS defines them. The, um, as well as people getting involved, absolutely. We're at the beginning of this, um, finishing the technical issues of distributing content. Those will be um, laid out fairly soon. If people in and of themselves want to see the content, they can always see a lot of it on our website. We'll be setting up um, low cost subscriptions and looking to involve others and wanting to mix it and continue to do studies with it. So I welcome collaboration and interaction in a variety of forms, trying to create win-win you know, situations. If people are solely looking for themselves, seeing the content and looking at it regularly is the best way for themselves. Excellent. So two things that have hit my radar that I just wanna make sure we put out there for people. Number one, you've got people, photographers all over the world contributing images of kindness, correct? Yes. Do you need more contributors of pictures or not? Always. Okay. So there's one way, looking for a high quality, impactful visual message of connection with kindness, right? Absolutely. That, that would be wonderful. And we run an annual contest. We didn't do it uh, last year with COVID, but we run an international kindness photography contest and people can see some of the images on our site. I think that may become my favorite photography contest. I love photography. But this, this may be the kind of the cream of the crop. I'm assuming there's direction on the website as to what those pictures should look like or how to submit those? Yes. We don't have a contest active, though, as we're recording this. We will have one later this year. So if people are interested, they sign up on our website, and then we'll announce the contest. There's no fee to enter. We don't charge anything. And all we say is to people, um, if we like your image, we may use it to help other people see kindness. Excellent. And I want to make sure our viewers are clear. A not-for-profit organization does not mean it doesn't need funds to operate. So any operation requires funding. So there has to be some level of charging for services to be sustainable and or some mechanism for donation, correct? Yes. And and thank you for mentioning that. Yes, Um we have, there's a donation page and we've been the recipient of uh, some very generous uh, donations, but um, to expand this, um, all help is appreciated. And just for your viewers, um, as we're recording this, I am a volunteer. Excellent. Dr. Freiberg, thank you so very much. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing and yourself, myself, and hopefully all of us watching this, let's make the world a better place. Thank you very much. And stay tuned for part two, where we get into how this actually works.